So I wanted to talk to you uh, uh, about politics. You've obviously gotten involved in Joe Biden's uh, uh, election campaign. Why have you called this the most important election of our lives in, in the history of America? Well, I don't. I, I, you don't have to pay too much attention to the news to realize the, you know, the great divisions that's, that's going on. I think the United States of America is going through a great reckoning on a number of uh, the facets of what it means to be an American. Um, you know, in the past, there were uh, there were Republicans that were that I never I never questioned that their their sincerity or their belief in the American system. Uh, and I think with the administration the way it's been, I think uh, I'm I'm not I'm not sure the man has has took his oath seriously to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Um, you give a guy a fair shot for as much as you can, and I have, you know, I have great faith in the, uh, in our system of government. But I believe that uh, I have witnessed, from my perspective, is that there is fear and outrage and xenophobia has been commoditized. It's because it's turned into uh, the bigger trademark for how. Uh, for how America um, puts itself out in the world, I, I think the United States of America is the great is the promised land, the mo the closest the world has ever gotten to a true promised land, and I think that uh, this election is about uh, whether or not we, the people of the United States, are going to um, promote the general welfare and provide for the common defense and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and for our posterity. We need a brand of guidance and we need a brand of common sense and we need a brand of selflessness that uh, has not been on display for, for this administration. I want to talk to you, though, about uh, a kind of a, a powerful moment in, in your life, was, which was actually speaking at President Obama's inauguration in 2009. What do you recall from that moment? Well, we were all on the on the cusp of a, a a without a doubt a historic moment in the history of our republic. Simply because a black man was going to be living in the White House, this was this was huge. This was a thing that we always anticipated was going to come around at some point, maybe even become commonplace. That it wouldn't be such a historic uh, uh, moment of uh, of notoriety. I was asked before the. Uh, in the ceremonies before the uh, um, uh, inauguration to read the great, you know, Lincoln portrait. To be in Washington, D.C. at a time when the first black president uh, for the country was being, uh, was going to be, was going to be taking office, to me it was as monumental as an evolutionary place in the country and the republic, equal to a, a man finally landing on the moon, equal to a, at a, a uh, victory being declared in, uh, in, in World War II, you sort of remember where you were and, and realize that a Rubicon had been crossed. We were a different country as of that moment. I, I'm not sure how many times you spent the night at the White House, but I, I think the first time was in the Clinton administration. Uh, you were invited by President Clinton to spend the night. Tell me about what you recall from that. Uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, there was there was an op there was always a lot of people when the Clinton in the Clinton White House, uh, <clears throat> and so part of look there's a no smaller part of holy cow I'm in the White House. This is a big, big deal. I will tell you there was there was one time that was that I was we happened to be in the White House. Didn't spend the night. Uh, we had been me and the, me and the family had been in uh, Washington D.C. We were dedicating the National World War II Memorial on, at its opening. George, George W. Bush was president. I sat next to him and we chit chatted a little bit during the, uh, during the ceremony that was out on the mall. And uh, we had arranged, a, my, my younger kids uh, had not been in the White House ever, so we were able to arrange for a tour. And it was a Sunday, so it was a day off. And so when they when he was going to come down and I guess go to the gym or something, we were sort of like asked to go stand in one of the other rooms. But my wife had gone to the restroom. She had gone and she had come out and she was walking down the hallway. And uh, I hear her out there and she says, well, hello, Mr. President. And uh, President uh, uh, George W. Bush said, well, hello, who are you? 
And she says, well, I'm, I'm Rita Hanks. She used Rita Hanks then. And uh, we were just here, and I'm here with the family. Said, oh, yeah, really? Well, where are they? So we stepped out, and the president was in his, uh, he was in his, his dress for the gym. He was getting on the treadmill. He was running shorts and stuff. We talked a little bit, <clears throat> introduced him to my kids, and it was so kids I got breathless for a second, you know? And uh, he, asked, uh, he asked my son, I said, so, hey, hey, what's it like? Uh, what's it like having a famous father? What's it like having a famous dad? And my son said, well, it's, you know, there's advantages and there's disadvantages. <laughs> yeah, good answer. I know a little something about that. Hey, come on, I want to show you something. And, and uh, George W. Bush took us, took us around. We went outside. We walked around the lawn. He showed us the trees that the presidents had planted. He found a dead crow, a dead blackbird on the grass. And he said, oh, oh that ain't good. That ha- we see that on the ranch all the time. And he picked it up and he threw it in the bushes. And then we went into the, through the Rose Garden. We went into the Oval Office, the back way. It was really, it was really a, a a fantastic day that happened totally by incident. And in all anybody who's been to the, to the White House more than more than once remembers every time they've walked through those those doors. And there's there's always some that stick out, and that was certainly one of them. You're a passionate historian. I mean, you have produced more content around World War II than most, obviously. Um, what was it about uh, the picture, uh, the famous picture of the young boy I- in Poland that caused you early on to want to learn everything you could about the Holocaust? Oh, I did not know anything about the Holocaust until I was in fifth grade. I was 10 years old. The war at that time was essentially the stuff of movies and TV shows like combat or something like that. I know that my dad was in the war. He was in the Navy in the Pacific. The moment of finding out about what the Holocaust was, was it, 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 it's, it's, it was a rite of passage. It was like a slow, slow motion entry into adulthood. It was um, having a window onto a degree of human behavior that made absolutely no sense to my 10 year old brain. And the photograph is a very famous photograph. It's about the very early in the war in Poland. And a, a young, I saw a young boy who was probably my age, who was holding up his hands as he was rousted from, uh, from his home in Poland because he, because he was a Jew. Um, I'm not saying that that was the moment where I wanted to learn, became a lay student of history. But it was a it was a bit of a crush. It was a bit of a hard, hard, uh, bitter um, lesson of uh, of of humanity. It slowly became a little bit more of an adult that day. Um, I grew up in Oakland, California. We learned about civil rights. We learned about Martin Luther King. We learned about George Washington Carver. We learned about Rosa Parks. We learned about an awful lot of good news about the progress of uh, civil rights and and uh, race in America, but how is it that at the age of 10 years old, I first learned about the Holocaust and yet had not ever been told about the 1921 event in Oklahoma in which Black Wall Street was burned down by white Oklahomans and 10,000 people were, uh, 10,000 black Americans were ushered to the, to the, to the city limits and, and told to leave. I mean, I, imagine never learning about and never imagine ever learning about the Holocaust. What kind of gap would that be in our in our sense of uh, world history? And and without an awful lot of uh, other lessons, there we have gaps in our own sensibility of American history. The World at War TV show, the TV newsreel yeah. footage, yeah. the Talking Heads, Lawrence Olivier. How did that impact you? That was huge uh, for a couple of reasons. One is. Um, because it really was an, an encyclopedia. It's like staying at home one day and reading an entire, entire encyclopedia about one subject. Part of it was I did not know of the vast scope of the war. It sounds like a stupid thing to say, but World War II covered an awful lot of the globe. I did not, I did not know about so many of the particulars. So historically, I learned a great lesson, but there was something else in there that was, that was, that would absolutely knock me out. And that was the presentation, the storytelling, that it was nonfiction, it was talking heads, it was archival footage, 
It was animation of maps and graphics, and it was riveting from an entertainment perspective. My head sort of exploded as far as what, how you could tell a story. You didn't even have to know the language. You could read the subtitles and get it. D describe the emotion uh, of walking on Omaha Beach and why you were so overcome and what you ended up doing. Well, I was not working that day. You know, we had already made, um, uh, we had shot Saving Private Ryan in Ireland and in England. And it was a very, very tactile experience for all of us. It was an uncomfortable movie to make but um, we couldn't wait to get to work every day uh, because of, uh, no, one had, no one had touched that subject matter in quite a, quite a long time. And we were, we were shooting it from a kind of like under the helmet perspective as opposed to something grander. You know, there's not a lot of big florid speeches in there. There's a bunch of a lot of guys slugging through and running, being scared out of their minds. So after that experience, um, the movie was shooting <clears throat> the, uh, the sequences there and I lingered. Well, I walked the length, the entire length of, of Omaha Beach from one end to the next. And just knowing everything that had happened there, I got to the very end. And I was wondering if there was going to be any sort of, any sort of sign of, of who we had, uh, of who we were. At the very end, there, there's memorials that are scattered all along. There's memorials to this outfit. There's memorials to these sailors. There's a memorial to the Canadian. It's, uh, there's memorials all scattered along. And you stop and you read each one. And at the end of it was this plaque on this concrete retaining wall. I'll, I'll butcher what it says, but it said, this is dedicated to uh, the 29th, soldiers of the 29th. And, the, uh, and it said, comp companies A, B, and C of the... Uh, Fifth Ranger Battalion, and that was us. We were Charlie Company of the of the Rangers, and to see that there after we had gone through this kind of thing, it was kind of rocked me, um, made the hair stand up in the back of my head. Then walking back down, back to the <clears throat> very famous uh, cemetery there, I just realized I was in a holy place. And we, had, we were interlopers, of course. We, were the, we, were, we had the audacity and the hubris to think that somehow we could, we could capture some of uh, what that place means in the history of the world. Uh, we did a, it turned out we did a, we sort of did, but at the end of the day, you, all you can do is, uh, all I can do is kind of like bow your head in, in understanding of, uh, you know, the, the great providence that had, that had happened there. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody who has, some some semblance of uh, historical knowledge or uh, even without it can can go to a place like that and they are scattered all over france they're scattered all over all over europe and uh, not take pause there and think what would i have done if i had been a 19 year old kid there on that day your process in preparation uh, you said once you get to a point as an actor where you realize you're examining an aspect of the human condition as opposed to just a story that starts on page one and ends on page 20. And to do that, you have to have some other stuff that's loaded up inside you, the stuff that happened before the movie began. You don't have to sit down and write it in longhand in single space on spiral notebooks, but it has to be a very tangible thing because it has to play out in every scene. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, what I, what I mean is it's the actor's job is, I think, is to, prov is to provide his own motivation. The actor himself, I think, has to, has to be able to go anywhere and do anything on a moment's notice in the course of the scene. I liken a lot to kind of like Joe DiMaggio in center field. He has to be ready somewhere before the pitch is thrown to go in any direction, fast, slow, loping as fast as one can, infield, outfield. As an actor, our task is to embody the truth of the moment. Um, and sometimes the truth of the moment is to get a laugh and sometimes it's to kiss a girl, but other times it's to, it's to capture, like lightning, uh, a, a fraction of a moment of, of true human behavior. You know, Hamlet says, you know, the jo actor's job is to hold the mirror up to nature. That's a noble pursuit and it's not easy to do. I'm 64 years old and I've been doing this professionally since I was really since I was 20. So I've got, how many years is that? I've got uh, 44 years 
of slow, slow progress of, of figuring out what this was, how to do this. And um, unfortunately, uh, there's no answer except you just got to go there. How true is it every time you would take a job, you would lose sleep over it the oh. night you made the decision? Oh, still do. Absolutely still do. Uh, it's uh, as soon as you as soon as you have that date on the calendar where you're going to have to show up and put on clothes that are not your own and pretend you're somebody that you're not, you're, you're running the great risk. It's a big high wire act um, because the, the, you got a 50 50 chance that you're going to that you're going to fail. <laughs> that you're not you're not going to be there. Any movie you go through is is an emotional ER, man. You 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 you're being whipped back and forth between moments where if you don't get it on that day, on that moment, it's not in the movie. <laughs> so, you better you better be there. The only thing you can do is stretch yourself to a limit and hope you come back. And as soon as I start a movie, as soon as I ever, as soon as it begins, there's there, certainly there's the exciting element of it, because, but that element is, is a, one of danger. <laughs> are you going to be able, are you going to be able to do it? Are you going to be able to look at yourself? And I, I still look at films and I think there's, there's moments where I go like that over the, over the, uh, over the TV or the, the screen. Cause I don't, I don't need to see myself be so disappointing. And this goes back to earlier days where you think, man, you're driving home at the end of the day or you're back at the hotel and you think, oh, man, I cracked it today, man. I was damn good. I popped that scene, man. I had the dialogue. I had the motivation. I was flexible. I crushed it. And then you see the movie and it's a big, fat nothing. Nothing works. Nothing's really? real. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It happens all the time. And the, and the inverse happens as well. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I'm not sure I even knew what that scene was about after we talked about it at the end of the day. I mean, did, did I even come close to getting there what it was supposed to? I don't know. I don't know. Ah, well, if it's not any good, it won't be in the movie. And then it ends up being like one of the most magnificent moments uh, of your career. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's cruel and indifferent fate. And you cannot, you cannot assume that you have done it great, nor should you assume that you've been a failure at it. I never trust any director who comes back and says, oh, the dailies were fantastic. That is a great scene. That is a great scene. No, you, director, you watch it daily, you come back and say, I don't know, my cut, you know, it was in focus. I wanted to bring up three situations and what okay. you were trying to gain from those instances. The first being uh, conversations with Sully uh, leading into your performance in the movie. Certainly with Sully, so with um, uh, Richard Phillips uh, for when we did Captain Phillips, and even um, Charlie Wilson when we made the movie uh, uh, Charlie Wilson's War. They were the guys. I was playing them, you know. Uh, and I, I said the same thing to them every time I sat down. Look, for, for good or bad, I'm you. I know you probably wanted, you know, Brad Pitt or Kevin Costner where you're stuck with me. Jim Lovell as well. This sort of like began with Jim Lovell on Apollo 13. Uh, and I said, look, um, well, I'm going to say things you never said. I'm going to do things you never did. I'm going to be places you never were. But I want to be as authoritative and actual and as real as possible. I want to carry as much as the DNA of you in that circumstance or you in that moment into this movie. Like this is a great example. We had a scene in, in Sully written by Todd Kermanicki that I said, what, what is this bullshit about, you know, Sully buying a tuna sandwich at, uh, at uh, LaGuardia before he goes on. And I said, I, and I apologize. I said, Sully, I'm sorry, but we're going to have you buy a tuna sandwich. And he says, Oh, you have to buy a tuna sandwich. And they're expensive at LaGuardia. I wish they were cheaper. And I said, well, <laughs> so what do you mean? He said, they don't pay us. They don't feed us on the plane. I said, wait a minute. I've seen movies about airlines and the stewardess brings you in a tray. for that. No, they save money. They don't feed us anything on the plane. We bring our own lunch. And I didn't know this, but uh, Sully told me that the moment the plane pulls away from the gate, 
There is no conversation allowed that is not about the position of the plane and the flight plan. If there's an accident and the FAA listens to the black box and hears you talking about the Knicks game and getting, getting a, get going out for good stakes in, uh, in Philadelphia, they, they will say, your mind was not on flying that plane. Knowing that there are these kind of pressures of it just end up adding to the tapestry of the movie. And when you were uh, in, in Castaway or preparing for the role uh, mm-hmm. of a shipwreck victim, you were studying the psychology of people in similar situations. You, you said at some point uh, in the latter half of shooting, you lost all sense of when the camera was actually rolling. Why? Mm-hmm. Well, because it didn't matter. <laughs> because that, that movie was literally about, about physical action. Um, and I don't even recall where the camera was set up. It was just always set up somewhere because what I had to do was I had to lash a raft together. I had to try to open a coconut. I had to, uh, I had to, I had to make a fire. I had to climb in or out of a cave. It was just me and the box and the lens and uh, and the behavior. And you said you almost felt like you were going nuts by the end of it, though. Yeah. And, and and that also you could actually hear what the volleyball Wilson was saying back to you. Yeah, when 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 Wilson was born, uh, I had dialogue with him, and I heard his I heard his dialogue in my head. Uh, we, I did go I did a, go crazy because I I never had a day <laughs> never had a day off. I never had a shot off. I was never off camera for anything. It was, it was, the whole movie was, the whole movie was like point and shoot. I, I don't even, I don't even recall hearing action and cut. You just kind of like, you just kind of like wander into the frame and wander out. And that's how, that's how we shot the movie. I, I it was, it could have been very, very undisciplined, but uh, Bob got what he needed. So thank God. In, in Forrest Gump, it explained uh, the battle with the studio over the cross country run and why oh, yeah. you actually ended up cutting checks yourself, I think. The, well, the studio just said, we can't afford it. You're not going to do it. And uh, Bob said, um, yeah, there's no movie. The, the, this, it's too important a part of the movie just to cut. We can make this work. And they said, no, you can't. And it came around to me and uh, uh, my, my crack agent said, uh, Bob's going to come talk to you about, about – um, but what we called it the run, you know, about the run. And I said, why is he talking to me? He's the boss. I'll do whatever he says. This is above my pay grade. And Bob came and he, and uh, we talked one night, he drove out and he talked to nine. And I said, how are you doing, Bob? And he said, look, I can't, I can't do that. You, you are the only guy in the, you are, you are Forrest Gump. You, you're the title role in this. There is no movie without you playing him. I need you to be not an actor, not an employee. I need you to be my soulmate. I will open up the cuts and, and talk about every aspect of the post-production of this with you, if you will be my, my, uh, my collaborator and not just my employee. And I said, uh, okay, deal. Okay, let's do that. Now what? And he said, well, this run is going to cost X amount of dollars. And it wasn't cheap. And uh, I said, okay. He said, I, you and I are going to split that amount. And we're going to give it back. Okay, we'll, we'll give you the money back, but you guys are going to have to share the profits a little bit more. Which the studio said, fabulous, great, okay. <laughs> it was good for us too. But then it happened again later on in the movie. They said... Uh, the weather is such that we can't, uh, we can't get the insurance coverage on it. The studio said, so you guys can't shoot. And we said, Bob and I said, oh, we'll cover the insurance. And we did. And so that, it ended up being very easy, very easy after that. And, you know, and Bob, is, Bob, was, not a, uh, Bob was not a pushover. We, we shot the first three days on, on that movie Bob came into me uh, on our third day and he said, hey, look, I know what you're trying to do. I know how nervous you are and I, I know how, how, self, uh, how self-conscious this can be before we get into the groove, but we, we're not going to use any of these first three days because I don't, I don't think you have it. 
you haven't got the character. And I said, I don't. I don't. You're right. So walk me through this. And he just said, don't do so much. Don't try so hard. And it was like, oh, geez. You know, I thought the job was to try as hard as you can. And, and then from that, everything settled down. I mean, it was in a, in a, in a moment's notice. But that's a, that's a type of collaborative process that, you know, it's come about between me and Bob now. We've, we've had some version of that every time we've worked together. And as Bob says, you know, all these movies are minefields. You have no idea if you're doing it well. You don't have no idea if you're, if you're making the right decision or not. You just have to go forward with a, a type of, uh, of faith um, that you have in yourself and, and in each other. Why with Toy Story 4, when you were reading the final lines, uh, did you feel like you were having an out-of-body experience? Oh, yeah, that was something else. We did the first Toy Story 25 years ago. It was in the 90s. We were just, we had come in just to take part in this new brand of animation, a new process of animation in a pretty hip story. And everybody has had a toy that they brought to it real life characteristics. I know I certainly did. And so I thought there was just a beautiful, a beautiful amalgam of, of real, real human emotion by way of the logic of the toys. We were part of some kind of like, masterpiece some sort of like benchmark in the industry and in the art of animation and we knew it and you think well knock it hey we <laughs> did that okay glad i was a part of that when we did the second one the disney brass had this whole kind of like formula that said the thing to do after you have a really big movie is to do a cheaper version of it and just put it out on video because everybody who loved the movie will buy the video. So again, it was Tim and I, and uh, we were there. Uh, we happened to be at the studio at the same time to, to go in and come out. And I looked at him and I said, uh, this is really good, isn't it? He said, yeah, you know, Tim is, you know, Tim, ah, yeah, no, this is, this, this is great. And I don't I don't understand why it's not coming out. I'm like, I, I, I got I got to talk to Eisner about this thing. This is too good to just throw out on that. I said, well, we ended up both both communicating to the brass. Why just taking the easy money and going to DVD? I understand it'll be profitable. I get that. But the second one, from a script story point of view, is as great as the first one was. What? What's the deal here? And... Uh, to to Disney's credit, they pondered it and they decided to pony up the extra money because it's more expensive. Then a long time went by till we did the third one. And oh my, I mean, <laughs> that third one made my wife cry. <laughs> so but now it's been now it's been coming on like to more than 15 years since we had done the first one. So the question is to whether or not there could be a fourth one, I think was weighed with the responsibility of making a fourth one. I think they, they were saying, we don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure this is the case, but I think we don't know if we can equal the first three with a fourth one. And I said, I get that. All right, I get that. But then they came to us and they said, we think we have something. After all that and the better part of 25 years to know that I was going back into recording Studio B, a uh, very famous room at uh at on the disney lot it's where we had begun it it's where i recorded the first lines as woody and it was where we were recording the very last lines as woody as well i had a bit of a life flash before our eyes i, I think we all did everybody you know don richard riffles has passed away lee ermy passed away so many people who are the original voices were no longer there were no longer part of it um and tim and i were still there Tim's got, I still got the same high squeaky voice and Tim's still down there, you know, where he can complain and gripe. Um, and we had compared notes. I said, have you been in for that? La have you recorded the last scene yet? And no, I haven't. Have you been da, da, da? And knowing that I was driving in to do it for the last time, I just thought this, 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 this doesn't happen that often in a career. I mean, every, you always have a last day of a movie. And for some people they have the last day of a franchise, but, the, to the four Toy Story movies were as individual as the Beatles were, you know. John and Paul and George and Ringo were all very different people. Uh, but, they, but together they were the Beatles. And I, 
when that that last day i actually i did i was recording something it was recording the last uh, the last lines and i felt myself rising up and i saw myself in this in the studio and uh that's you know when that that happens that's 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 one of the great blessings and curses of being an actor you have to work so hard in order to to defeat the self-conscious that you feel as a human being but then as an artist you end up seeing yourself as part of this great artistic process and uh it's a, it ends up being a spiritual moment why were you surprised by the lack of purpose you felt after that it's like when the kids you know when your kids leave home they've been growing up in the same bedroom all their lives and now they're gone and it's not going to be their bedroom anymore i said to my wife i said something grand has finished we we have finished something and um not only was there a bit of a post creative depression that toy stories were the toy stories were done uh but there was also a a, a sense of how complete an experience it was you know because as an actor i will say that the hardest physical work i've ever done as an actor has been the recording of those movies because you you cannot move you have no costume to hide in you have no you have no motion in order to to animate uh the the uh, the emotion you don't get to do that you have to stay locked in place on microphone and only use your imagination and your voice in order to in order to go there and i think i've probably recorded half of all the toy story movies with my eyes closed because you're you're trying to imagine a a place to get i i want to ask you about uh, your dad um how aware were you of his dreams uh back when you know he he was a young man which i i think was to go to college and then move to australia as a writer well my dad um got a raw deal when he was a very young man because he happened to be he happened to witness the death the the murder of his father in a fight um between a, he was 8 or 9 or 10 years old and a hired hand killed his father in the barn of the farm that they were growing up in Willows California he was one of four kids and he was the only one there and he was broken by that experience he had to go and testify as a kid three times you know with the lawyers and the judge and the flag and you do you hereby solemnly swear um and it was a it was a contentious fight the the man was acquitted uh by you know self defense because it was a fight but his father was killed and he witnessed that how do you think that uh, uh, affected him oh um it 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 ruined him it robbed him of uh it robbed him of a carefree life um it robbed him of a uh, of a uh, of of a sense of 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 uh fairness in the world it was a it was just a it was a black mark of injustice and unfairness that landed squarely on on his very young shoulders it wasn't right and he saw it i don't know what his relationship with his dad was he never spoke about it very much his mother was a his mother was a very religious woman and he didn't buy the religion at all and he he was a black sheep of the family but he was a black sheep of the family is because because of this thing that had happened this uh this tragedy um this scar that uh, he ended up carrying around with him for a long time i don't know if he ever communicated any kind of great joy that he got from anything that happened to his life until he married my stepmother you asked about you know what he wanted to do yeah my dad wanted to write he had to he had great uh great artistic uh, desires but you know, life life didn't deal him the cards in order to go off and pursue it other other things came along how did your role in nothing in common impact your communication with your dad well that was a big deal because that was uh gary gary marshall uh that was a moment of faith from him in which he said look we're going to do a mo- we're going to do a movie here and you know it's not just jokes this isn't just jokes we got to see you we got to see you and your father not get along and discover each other like that my dad was alive then and and uh uh we were uh, we're beginning to see each other a lot more as a matter of fact i think i uh, in the course of nothing in common uh, 
Uh, I got divorced from uh, my older kid's uh, mother and a uh, horribly painful time, fraught with uh, emotion and bad feelings and um, uh, the, the, you know, the failures that you go, you know, I thought, oh, I, I, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't be a worse couldn't be a worse father and I couldn't be a worse human being. And I told my dad at some point, I said, look, dad, I'm doing this movie with Jackie Gleason. And he's playing a guy who's sick and you were, you were sick. You might, he's got diabetes and you've got, you know, you got no kidneys. So I just, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of you and me in this movie. I just want you to know that before you see it. And, uh, you know, I think he appreciated it and that there was a place there, there was a place for common ground. And it turned out to be in a movie called Nothing in Common. To, to what extent did that cause you to have any conversations with him that up to that point you'd always been wanting to have? You know, I didn't burden my dad in that way. I didn't say, come on, dad, you know, what's the scoop? But what I did do was I, I listened for, for whatever, whatever would come out. So, you know, stories of him growing up, not so much about the loss of his dad, but growing up on a farm and the type of labor that he did. I think the, the prior to nothing in common, um, when I got my first job as a professional actor and I was going to leave California and go to Ohio to work the Great Lakes Shakespeare Festival as an equity actor, as a, as a professional guy, um, I took, I got together with my dad. I took him to the, to the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, a place that I had gone to a million times by myself. And uh, at intermission, I said, uh, what do you think, dad? He said, well, I, I think it's, I think it's uh, quite inventive, something else. I said, well, I'm going off to, to work as an actor in a repertory theater. And I, I don't think I'm coming back to LA uh, excuse me, I don't think I'm coming back to California after this. I'm going to go to wherever this is going to take me. But he couldn't quite fathom anybody in, in the Hanks family getting up on stage and saying, uh, give me your, let me have your attention, please. This was not in his, he, that's not in his DNA. He wasn't, he didn't think it was stupid. He didn't say, oh, for crying out loud, get a real job. No, just the opposite. He kind of like said, uh, well, I think that if you, that's what you want to do, then I think, I think that's what, then that's what you should do it. The, 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 the great thing of it was I was able to get established. Um, you know, the, I got the TV show. I was on Bosom Buddies. He got to see me every week. And then later on when I we got, was able to get the films. Uh, and the first time uh, when I was nominated uh, for, uh, for Big in the Academy Award, he and my stepmom came down. and We all went together. So he got to go to the, he got to go to the broadcast. So he was able to take in, you know, this kind of like grander aspect of uh, his kid making good enough headway in it, uh, in, a, in a realm that was completely alien to him. Your dad and your mom divorced when you were five. Uh, that, that I think you moved 10 times by oh, a the time times. you were 10, a five million. different cities, you and your two siblings. Uh, you and two of your siblings were with your dad. Your other sibling was with your mom, but that also, you know, involved changing schools, new friends. Uh, how did all of that, you think, affect you as a kid? Well, I, I the different. The three of us all reacted very differently. My older brother was very shy, and he didn't do well. I loved it. <laughs> I kind of dug it. Um, I, I like going into a new circumstance. I, I think I learned skills of. Uh, you know, sort of like seducing a room. I, I never walked into a, a new social circumstance and felt clumsy or odd or, or shy. I came in kind of like looking, bopping around, looking, looking for action. Now understand, I was the youngest. I was always the youngest in the house. And when my older sister and older brother were there, you know, they ran the roost and I was just, I was kind of like the mascot there. So there were sometimes um, maybe uh, uh there was a degree of loneliness because at really no one, I, I kind of like fell through the cracks and didn't really have a, adults per se that were taking care of me, but I was not abused and I always had a key to the house and uh, I could always drink all the milk that was in the refrigerator, whether anybody was home or not. So I actually, it actually was probably the perfect, you know, 
background for a guy whose job it is to put on clothes that are not his and pretend to be somebody that he's not. Why is it you still cannot eat tomato soup? <laughs> you have done your research. <laughs> because um, we were tasks, tasked with making our own lunches and dinners. And an open can of Campbell's tomato soup on a pan on a range turned up high boils over very quickly. <laughs> and if, if you're fighting with your sister and trying to watch a, you know, an episode of Leave it to Beaver, you kind of forget that that pot's on the stove. And the smell of burnt tomato soup, I mean, thank God they didn't have uh, uh, smoke detectors in apartments back then. We would have set one off every third day. <laughs> Uh, uh, something was burning in our in our kitchen and the smell of tomato soup and then trying to clean it off with steel wool before dad got home. Uh, yeah, that's a bad vibe. How often would you go to plays and movies by yourself growing up? Oh, my Lord, that was great. I mean, I, the, the education I got in, in, the, in, the, in an audience from that place was priceless, Doubly so because I was alone and I was taking it all in by myself. I wasn't talking to anybody. I wasn't on a date. I wasn't goofing off. I drove over by myself. I bought myself a sandwich. I will say that sometimes in line, I had to put off the advances of some older gentlemen that were very interested <laughs> in a young man who was coming to the theater by himself. Um, but I even, I even understood the, the social, social aspects of that. Um, and it was, it was incredibly important. I, I, the, the, and, and I still do. And then when you're 20, you're cast in a play that's guest directed by Vincent Dowling. Uh, yeah. what did he say in that first rehearsal that kind of tied everything together? He said, you know, work, work in the theater is more fun than fun. It is. It's more work in the theater is more fun than fun. And I thought that is exactly how I feel. I would rather be in a play than do anything with my life. I'd rather be in a play than go skiing. I'd rather be in a play than go to a baseball game. I'd rather, I'd rather be in a play than go to the movies. I'd rather be doing this than anything else. So then he said, all of the great plays are about loneliness. We're all fighting. Hamlet is about loneliness. And that was, uh, it could very well have been the same night he said work in the theater is more fun than fun. I seem to remember it might, as, might have been. That actually unlocked a door of, of a, what, what my personal connection was to an awful lot of this stuff. Why was I so intrigued by it? Why did I keep coming back again and again and again? And it, he answered the question for me. It's because I was seeing people who I related to in their battle against against loneliness and i think he was i think he was right all the great stories are still about our desire as human beings not to be alone COVID 19 you and your wife rita obviously the first two high profile individuals to come out saying you had it uh, you made two comments that i was curious to get you to elaborate on the first one being uh it felt like my older brother was holding me down and punching me in the ass. Uh, and then uh, felt like my bones falling apart and made of saltines. Yeah. And I had, the, the, my had, I had bad body aches. Look, here's what we did not have. We did not have spiking fevers. We did not have clouding lungs and we did not have a lack of oxygen in our blood. So we were, we were, we had symptoms, we were ailing, but our lives were not in danger. Um, my wife had very different, she lost her sense of taste and smell. I did not. She had horrible nausea. They were worse than mine and they lasted longer. I, I, I had body aches that made me think that my, uh, my, bo my bones were, were breaking up. And uh, when I, that, that story about my brother punching me in the butt, I, it just it just seems like everything hurt. I just hurt. To what extent was there any concern at the time just for your lives? Oh, I didn't have any. I never felt as though our, our lives were, my life was in danger. Whenever they came in and they would x-ray us a couple of times a day to see what our lungs were, they said, it's fine. Every time they came in to check our temperature, they said, oh, you know, you're okay. You're, you're only at 37. You know, it's centigrade. I, you know, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything. 
Um, but they, they, they never said, no, you're fine. You're okay. I, we, I never felt as though we were, you know, we were at, uh, at, at risk of mortality. Your last film release, Greyhound, was supposed to be released in the feed theaters, yeah. uh, ends up getting released through Apple TV+. Plus. Uh, you had to okay that move. Tell about them coming to you with the idea and your thought process in okaying it. Well, I, actually, uh, it was my idea. <laughs> I fought for it. And the film was going to come out originally on the 15th of May, more or less for the anniversary of the... Uh, a VE day. I said, okay, that's appropriate. That's, that's nice, a nice marketing tie in. Um, but as COVID came along, it shut down our, shut down our post-production facilities. And so we were going to be late anyway. And then everything shifted and we were going to come out on the 8th of January in business wise, just, we would have come out between Wonder Woman and Top Gun 2. That, well, that was our window we would have been bridging this place that might not have had a lot of fuel to burn in it. Now that's got nothing to do with how great we thought the movie was or how special it was. It had nothing to do with that. It was literally economic concerns from the marketing wing of the entertainment industrial complex. That's worthy of a symposium <laughs> uh, all unto itself. The other, but the bigger thing of it was, was this is that, our movie is done and no one can see it. <laughs> Pardon my language. How, uh, what can we do here? My original thought was to say, everybody is locked down. There was a COVID-19 process that is, that is, we are not going to know how long this pandemic is going to go on. There is fear and there is, there is, there is, um, there's fear and isolation that are going on right now. Let's put this movie on commercial television. So my crack team of experts went to uh, all the networks that were interested. I'm talking about CBS and NBC and ABC and said, would you guys like to have this movie? It cost $40 million to make. They couldn't, they couldn't pay $40 million for, for it. They just couldn't. They, they don't have that. They don't have that cash. So the, the next thing was, is like, okay, well, if it's, if it's the other option is, is streaming, um, let's see what the, let's see what the interest there would be and what the window would be to come out because Greyhound there, it's about stasis. It's, 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 it's about, it was, a, it's about surviving a, a, a long crisis one day at a time, one moment at a time there, there is a thematic element that is, that speaks very much to the, the, the universal pandemic that is COVID-19. And uh, Apple, God bless them, they came along and said, we really want this. And um, they made an offer that, that, that paid for the movie and put it in the black. And there is no guarantee this movie would have been in the black had it been released in the motion picture theaters. How did the experience impact your view of putting future projects on streaming? Well, it's going to work great for some things, and it's going to be uh, 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 perhaps a handicap or a second place for others. You know, um, I think one of the greatest films that I've seen, certainly in the last few years, was actually, I think it's the five-part Chernobyl that was done on HBO. I think it was fantastic. I think there is a place for streaming that is going to be an end in of itself for any number of, diff of types of films. I think the cinematic experience is irreplaceable for other types of films. There are some films you've just got to see, not just on the big screen, not just with the great sound, but you have to see it in a room with 200 or 600 or 1,200 strangers. So you take part in that cultural uh, uh, collection, cultural moment. Look, I don't want to see Quentin Tarantino's movies for the first time streaming. I want to go to the movie theater and see that the same way. I want to see Chris Nolan's movie on a screen when I the first time, same way I want to see an awful lot of movies for the first time. I want to see it on the big screen if I can, but if they're not going to be there, I might have to just see them for the first time, you know, in a um, screened on a very good TV at, uh, at somebody's house with a, with as good a sound bar as as they have and that's just going to be the nature of the beast before you found success 
uh, what were the ways in which the, the smart ways in which you go about saving money? Well, I was not profligate, you know, I didn't blow a lot of money. I was not, I, I didn't have any vices. I didn't have any bad habits. I could not sleep at night if I knew that next week or next month was going to be, uh, be at risk. So I, I, I saved money. I, I, I didn't, I didn't spend money stupidly. When we were down to uh, living on a serious budget, though, and it was time to go to like do a week of grocery shopping, we'd kind of like imagine, okay, we, I think we could, we have $45 here. Let's, what can we do for $45? And anytime we bought something, I rounded up the cost, you know, and it never, never failed to make me feel good because we'd have a, a week's worth of groceries and I'd still have the, like, I get three bucks back from my 40. So we, we could do it all for $42. There's a moment where you're at a chemical bank branch in New York, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, waiting to deposit an out of state check. What do you remember from that? Uh, well, okay. Here's, this is a pretty good story. You ready for this? We were in New York. I, I had sold the car and a few of things and I had a bankroll and put the deposits down on a pretty dark and dingy apartment there in Hell's Kitchen. So I was waiting for my first unemployment check to come in. And so I, I was going from having $25 in the bank to having close to, close to $500 in the bank. That, that, that's a big day. And I wanted to draw some money off of that in order to, uh, in order to, get, <laughs> in order to buy groceries. And uh, they, they insisted on waiting for the check to clear. And it was a, a state, it was a check from the state of Ohio. And I, 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 I'm not a contentious guy, but I did, I did cause a stink. I said, look, I got a kid who needs groceries. This check is from the state of Ohio. It's good. And the bank manager was very pissed off at me. And he said, he, he let me write a check for like, like 50 bucks, you know, off the thing. The bigger thing about that, that was from a chemical bank. That bank that space on the second floor of that building right now was converted into a Bubba Gump shrimp company, <laughs> shrimp restaurant. <laughs> so the place, so there you go. There's, there's, there's cruel fate, odd fate right there. To set the scene where you move from New York to LA uh, and you end up needing to ask your producers to borrow money. We had made the pilot for Bosom Buddies, Peter Scolari and I. Um, the show got sold. Uh, I left, we, we, we tried to sublet our apartment in New York and we went to Los Angeles uh, with the understanding that we were gonna go, we were gonna go into production uh, in July. But the actor's strike of 1980 came along and shut that down and I ran out of funds. I couldn't afford rent in both LA and uh, New York. So I informed the, uh, the producers uh, that I'd been in LA and I said, I'm, look, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't want to screw things up, but I, I have to go back to, to New York because of the strike. And they said, well, why didn't you ask us for an advance? That's allowed. I, I, I wouldn't know how to do that. Hey, I haven't done any work for you guys, but, but pay me a few thousand bucks. And they said, of course we do that for you. That, that was Tom Miller and Bob Boyette. Their kindness and their largesse made it possible for me and my family to, uh, to be secure in Los Angeles. And to this day, if I ever run into Bob, I always get down on, on one hand and uh, one knee and I kiss his hand and thanks. Because that, I mean, it's not often you can say somebody saved your life. Bob Boyette saved, saved my life. How did you work to avoid your success not dampening motivation or passion for your children? We were always able to separate the professional responsibilities to, from the private ones. There are times you have to be, you know, in, in public, and there's times that you shouldn't be in public. And we've always, when the kids were growing up, we, we protected that very, very specifically. But, uh, you know, my older kids uh, grew up when I was just kind of like a, a guy working, not so much uh, uh, anybody in, in the real public eye. My younger kids, it was different for them. But early on, you know, when they're, when they're little kids, you just, you just try to just to be a guy who drives the carpool and picks them up after school and uh, is around as much as possible. It's not easy, you know. There's a, 
you don't win all the time. And you can't avoid uh, some aspects of being in the public eye when you'd rather not be. But uh, if you work at it and you always just, you know, you, you don't play into it too much. If you don't make it seem more important than, uh, than it is, uh, you know, you can do okay for, for long enough. Well, your son, Colin, who's a, a successful actor, um, once said, uh, he left it up to me. He didn't help me. I'm so grateful he did that because it made me a very grounded, a very down-to-earth individual who takes nothing for granted. Explain what, what the thinking was with that and kind of his, uh, with regards to his pursuit of the profession. With um, two of my kids, Colin and, uh, and also uh, Chester, um, I saw them, I saw them on stage the same age that I was when I thought, this is fun. I'd like to do more of this. And it was in, it was in school. And when they do it, there's just no denying that. And I told them both, you know, I said, you could do this if you want, you know, if you have the perseverance, you've got, you've got the goods. What I was able to do for both my kids was give them that first job on a movie. Colin was in that thing you do and he had a line. And so he got, got his Screen Actors Guild card. Chester was in Larry Crown. He had a line. He got his Screen Actors Guild card. And after that, it's up to them. If you can't, you can't keep giving them jobs because then the only jobs they have is under, under your auspices. So everything else is their pursuit. No one can do it for you. No one can hand you anything. They can literally hand you a fishing pole and say, get fishing. That's it. But I don't want to discount how impossible it is to get that first job that gives you a Screen Actors Guild card. That is the leg up I was able to give both those kids. But they had to want to do it. You know, they had to say, I'll, I will take this and then go on from there. Thanks very much. And they both did. Colin's pursuit of that, it, it's blown me away. Sometimes I land on things that he did, and I just said, what did you do this for? Oh, I said, oh, I did this for a friend of mine, blah, blah, blah. Didn't even, didn't even know he was, didn't even know he was up to it. How did you learn how to be a dad when the example you had, uh, you know, acted probably differently than you wanted to be as a father? It was not a uniform process. I have four kids. Uh, Colin is in his 40s. My daughter Elizabeth is in her 30s. My son Chester just turned 30, and my son Truman is uh, 24. I was a different dad for each one of those guys. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I learned through a process of uh, elimination, of learning what not to do as opposed to what to do as a dad. You said, you know, on kind of the, the first marriage front once, uh, d divorce brought back bad feelings from the past. You were consumed by guilt. Food didn't taste good. You couldn't sleep. Um, and that, that you couldn't shake the feeling that no matter what you did, your kids would feel abandoned uh, like, like you did. Um, what do you remember from that time? Horribly painful time, fraught with uh, emotion and bad feelings and um, uh, the, the, you know, the failures that you go, you know, I thought, oh, I, I, um, I couldn't, I couldn't be a worse, couldn't be a worse father and I couldn't be a worse human being. I remember, I remember all those feelings of, as though I had, uh, I had cursed innocent beings with my own failings. I think the job as a parent, what the things I've learned is to try to guarantee a carefree life for your children for as long as possible. They should not be burdened with the cares of the world until they can handle them. And I felt uh, in the course of being their divorced single guy dad that I was, I was burning them with cares that they, they, that they didn't deserve to have to carry. At the time you were in, uh, I think, therapy three times a week. You said, oh, yeah. you, you said, I was sad, confused, emotionally crippled. I guess the house of cards has to fall in before you start to figure things out. Uh, yeah. How so? Well, I felt like I could, was a complete abject total failure and everything I thought was working was, was actually not working. It's a place that everybody comes to in their life for one reason or another. You know, I go off and talk to somebody and say, what, what have I done wrong? 
and they would say, well, what do you think you've done wrong? Why am I so unhappy? Well, tell me about your unhappiness. And you work through that till you figure out that, you know, number one, you have been an idiot, but number two, you're, you're no longer an idiot. It's human nature to go through these kinds of, not just depressions, it's not, just a, not necessarily a clinical thing, but you just go through dark times. You just go through, you just go through moments where you think, oh man, I'm fucked, and I'll never be anything other than just like this guy that I am now, but you learn. The aid that you can get from just asking these questions of yourself uh, and verbalizing it to somebody who's, who's really a really good student of human nature can help you get through some very tough times. Now, sometimes, it, sometimes it's, a, it's a, you know, a priest at the church that you trust. Sometimes it's a, it's a really good friend. I've had versions of all those things that have, have been the type of people that have said, you know, you're not a horrible person. And this, this will pass. You just got to have a little bit of faith in the goodness that is inside yourself. Then you end up marrying into uh, an old world family type structure, as you called it, uh, where people actually wanted to be together. You know, when I met my wife, um, Rita, uh, I, had gone, I had never been part of a full-time large structure of a of a family that had like a kind of like heritage. So I ended up getting, I got this kind of like solid dose of a normalcy that had been completely absent for me. Uh, prior to that, it was about moving and prior to that life was about work. And when I met her, it was like she had deep roots. I immediately felt, felt comfortable. I immediately felt like I was with people who were interested. And you were able to construct a number of things in the movie Philadelphia apparently because of your relationship with Rita, right? I would say that getting married and, and having an established family and just being a guy in the neighborhood was something that I always thought was going to happen, but it never had. And then when it did, it made so much sense that it ended up freeing me up, I think, to ponder other aspects of what I do for a living and of what that artist that I wanted to be. One of the things about Philadelphia that was both that it had in its pocket and that it also was opposite from so much else of the, of the cultural discussion about being gay in America and contracting AIDS is that we were, you know, uh, Andy, who I played, was part of a family and part of a monogamous relationship. And that was all he knew and that's all he wanted from life. And yet so much of what the, the, the gay community was saying, that does not, that does not reflect who we are. And both things were correct. It didn't. And he was not a certain type of person. He was, a, he was a family man. What Ron wrote, Ron Nicewater, and what Jonathan was going for in that was, we, we want you to be our brother. We want you to be somebody's friend. We want you to be that coworker and that, and that, that brother, that, that cousin that is gay and has AIDS. And I, the, 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 I get around to what your question is, is what I was, what I, what I recognized the first time that they were talking about it with Ron and, and Jonathan and Ed Saxon, the, the producer, when they came to me, I kind of said, uh, oh, I know why you guys want me. I know why, because I'm a family man. That's right. I'm not a renegade. I'm not a hell's angel. I'm not a hellion. I'm not a party boy. I'm a family man. And I could be gay and I could have AIDS. And I got to tell you, I talked to guys who died in the course of making the movie and when the movie came out. And uh, they, were, they were family men, too, in their way. So we, we ended up touching on, on something that was, I, 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 I compared it in a lot of ways to a, the movie like uh, Gentleman's Agreement in the, in the early 1950s was about being Jewish um, in a way that was like, is that really an issue? Well, it turned out, yeah, it was. I heard that at least at one point you were big into surfing, and I had uh, somebody uh, tape a question uh, for you that I'm, okay. I'm going to play for you. Tom Hanks, Kelly Slater here. How are you? Kelly! Graham sent me a message and said to give you a question, so here it is. I used to know Brian Grazier a bit, and uh, we had a bunch of mutual friends, and we talked about surfing uh, quite a lot, and he told me you made him buy a house at Malibu near the beach 
just so you guys could surf together and have competition. So I'm wondering where your surf level is at these days and if you're still getting the water. Kelly Slater, holy smokes, living legend, Kelly Slater. Oh my God, oh Lord. That's like having, that's like having Joe DiMaggio ask you a question about playing three flies up when you were a kid. This is unbelievable. Kelly Slater, okay, let me, I'm gonna show you something. I don't know if you can see this. Yep. Wait a minute, hold on. I'm gonna move, oh, wait a minute, where is it? Hold on. <laughs> I'm trying to put, there it is, hold on. I don't know if you can see this right here. See that? Yeah. I have a vicious scar I have in my calf from Brian Grazer running over me on his surfboard and his fins sliced me open to the point that I had to go to the clinic there in, in, in Malibu <laughs> and get 37 stitches on the inside and the outside. And my calf muscle has always been too short ever since then uh, because I made the mistake of surfing with Brian Grazer. He was a short board surfer. I was a, I'm a longboard surfer. Now, now I just do paddle boards. I haven't, I haven't surfed uh, in waves in a long time, but paddle boards work. Um, Brian, I did not tell Brian to get that house. He already had that house in Malibu, but uh, uh, that I did learn how I did first learn how to do it out there. And, and now, now a, a, a board cannot be long enough or big enough for a guy like me. Slow, easy. If I could get if I could get a 1968 Buick to float, that's what I would surf on now. <laughs> the bigger, the the more flotation. Give me a paddle, and and I'm found with that. That Kelly Slater would even ponder me to be a a, a surfboard. You just made my night. That that is fantastic. What do you enjoy about surfing? Well, when I do it, what I like about paddle boarding is is uh, the glide. I'll never sit in a kayak again. I'll never go canoeing if I can have a, a, a paddleboard to stand up on. It is a type of freedom. And when you can get, you know, look, I'm a horrible surfer and I will, I will, I will pitch out at, at the sign of any kind of like turbulent wave coming my way. But if you can get a little something and you can get going and you can, uh, you can land in that curl just a little bit and it's nothing but mother nature that is propelling you, um, it, you, f you feel like you're flying like Superman. Wilson or Spalding? Well, you'd say goodbye, Mr. Spaulding, but you'd, you'd, you'd share your heart with Wilson. So I'll say Wilson. Steven Spielberg or Ron Howard? Oh, come on, man. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not stepping in that one. You've got mail or sleepless in Seattle? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I'd say uh, sleepless in Seattle. For the for the water skiing, Jesse or Bo Peep? Mm. Bo Peep. Jesse's a pal. Bo Peep is love. Winning an Oscar for best actor or for best picture? Uh, well, I've never. Uh, okay. Hey, man, you, you got to be careful in both circumstances. So, uh, 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 the latter, whatever one that was. <laughs> I can't remember now.